Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna hold. We're gonna wait just another minute or so to see if we uh, gather some additional participants. Sure. Mm. And, uh, Dr. Richards, I think we're going to go ahead and get started if you're if you're good. Sounds good. All right. Um, so uh, good morning to all. Um, welcome to the remote experience for young engineers. My name is Stephen Barry, and I'm a member of the Reyes planning team. And I'm going to serve as your host today. And Dr. Um, Sherwood Richards from the University of Tennessee is going to join us in, uh, for today's lecture on how to explode a star. Um, today's discussion with Dr. Richards is going to offer us insights into stellar explosions, uh, an area of study that remains a goldmine of discoveries for the next generation of astrophysicists. Um, Dr. Uh, Richards is an, assist, is an assistant professor in the Department of Physics and Ast Astronomy at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Uh, his, group study, his group studies the behavior of neutrinos and astrophysical explosions in order to understand what observations of core collapse, supernova, and neutron star mergers can tell us about the behavior of matter in conditions impossible to recreate in a laboratory. Dr. Richards earned his Bachelor of Arts in Astronomy and Physics from the University of Virginia and his master's and doctoral degrees in physics from Cal, the California Institute of Technology uh, and, and fellowships at North Carolina State, as well as the University of California, Berkeley. Um, if you do have questions today throughout the uh, webcast, you can enter your questions into the chat. Uh, I'm sorry, into the Q&A box, not the chat box, the Q&A box. And uh, I will wrap those up at the end, and we'll have Dr. Richards try to answer as many as possible. So um, without any further ado, Dr. Sherwood Richards. All right. Thank you so much for the, the kind introduction. Also, if anybody has questions uh, during the talk, if there's a mechanism for doing that, I would be more than happy to have people uh, interrupt and ask questions during the talk. Uh, makes it makes it a little bit more, more fun in conversation. Um, so yeah, I, I figured I'd have uh, a little bit of fun today talking about uh, astro astrophysical explosions. Uh, it's a, uh, certainly a very uh, a topic that I'm I'm very passionate about. Um, but also, I, I want to emphasize that it's this is not one of those topics that it has been solved in the '70s and we're just learning about you know everything that, that people learned uh, 50 years ago. Um, this is a very rapidly evolving field, and it's something that's going to continue holding a lot of uh, interesting things to. Uh, for everybody, you know, moving you know hundreds of years into the future. So uh, hopefully, I'll get that across. Um, but as I'm talking about this, there's some stuff that that we've uh, figured out that 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 shows how exciting the universe actually is. Um, but there's also a lot that we really don't know, um, and that's what we're going to need. Um, all, you know, the the entire next generation, more than one generation of, of scientists to to figure all this stuff out. Okay, so. I will start by um, pointing out that normally when we look at the night sky, uh, it seems very calm, very serene. Uh, the same thing is up there every night. We see the, the, the Milky Way, the band in the Milky Way, the sky is really dark. There's all these different stars and they, they stay put, they stay where they are and nothing really changes. Um, now, except, you know, the moon is moving through the sky that you see that, that move uh, from, from, month, or from, from day to day. Uh, the sun is also moving in the sky, and that's where we get the, the signs of the zodiac from. Um, and you might also notice that, that some years you can see planets, some years you can't. So the planets are moving too. That's really all that happens, right? Um, well, in rare instances, uh, so for instance, uh, about 30 years ago in 1987, there was a supernova in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which was close enough so that uh, we could see it um, with, with the naked eye. This is an image taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, so you can see a lot of the detail. But looking with with the naked eye, it, it just looked like a, a bright spot in the sky. It brightened over the over the period of a, a couple of days and then started dimming over over a couple of weeks. Um, but this is this is something that happens, you know, once in 
50 years maybe that we had uh, a supernova close enough that we can just see it with the naked eye. However, even with a little bit of added power, um, uh, say with a, a small telescope, uh, you can see this kind of thing happening much more regularly. Uh, so this is an example of a supernova taken with this, this small amateur telescope. Um, and uh, it's much like the, the supernova that, ha that happened, the naked eye supernova that, that happened 30 years ago. Uh, it's just a little bit more distant, so it's harder to see. And so if you get, if you get a telescope to collect some of that, ex that extra light, um, you can see many more of these happening uh, much more frequently. Uh, you might have heard that there was a supernova uh, just a couple of months ago um, in the Pinwheel Galaxy, which was the, the closest supernova in about 10 years or so. Um, this is showing a couple of pictures. You can see there's uh, May 17th, May 19th, and May 20th. So over the course of a couple of days, this uh, supernova brightened, and over uh, the weeks following, it, 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 it dims back down. Um, now, the Pinwheel Galaxy is 21 million light years away. Uh, so it's still way too far to see with the naked eye. Um, the uh, so if if we look at uh, the the supernova that we could see with the naked eye, that was about um, 150,000 light years away. This is 21 million light years away, so a couple of order mag orders of magnitude further. Um, but I'm very hopeful that within my lifetime there will be another one of these super close by supernovae um, that 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 we can actually see uh, without a telescope. Okay, so my claim is that uh, this is this little brightening and dimming of light represents uh, a rather extreme stellar explosion. Um, so I'll, I'll motivate that a little bit um, moving uh, later in the presentation, but maybe I, I, I should start with uh, some explosions that are a little bit more familiar. So uh, here in the US, at least, we uh, just a couple of days ago celebrated our Independence Day, lots of fireworks. Um, and uh, but I think it's it's interesting to look at at how the fireworks actually work because there's some some analogies for for how things work in in uh, stellar explosions as well. So this is what professional fireworks look like. Uh, we have a, a long row of mortars. Uh, each of these mortar is is just a tube with a closed bottom, and you lower the firework into it. You light the fuse, and uh, it shoots up in the sky and, and explodes. Um, so in detail, the way that it works, so you have this fuse. Uh, so this is the fuse. Uh, let's see, I should be able to pop. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this is the fuse. And so you light the fuse and it comes down. And the first thing it burns is uh, this black powder here, uh, which just burns uh, very rapidly. And so you have this uh, this very hot gas beneath this, this ball, which is the rest of the firework. And so that shoots it out of the mortar and it, it shoots high into the sky. So that's that's what you see when it when it shoots up. And then there's a fuse that's lit. So this this uh, this fuse starts burning slowly. And after about three seconds or so, the the flame gets to the inside of the of the firework here. And at that point, uh, you light this this black powder and um, and it causes the the, the whole firework uh, to explode. Um, these little balls are are the uh, some balls of flammable metal that creates the, that create the various colors that you see in the stream is coming out. But the important part is uh, just that there's, uh, you, you burn this uh, black powder, which creates very hot gas, which is confined inside of the shell. And when you have very hot gas it's confined, it'll explode. Okay, so let's take it up a step. Um, so we, we uh, Fireworks are, you know, a small fraction of a percent efficient in terms of the total fundamental energy that they have. Um, that so, uh, all mass has inherent energy, and so you use a small amount of that mass to to create this firework. Um, and so, it's it's a very, very, very small portion of the of the total mass that's actually used. In the case of nuclear power, it's much more efficient, and so with the same amount of mass, you can get a whole lot more power. And so the way that these work is you once again have uh, some central uh, source of fuel. And uh, in, in, in the case of, of nuclear power or uh, of nuclear explosions, you uh, you have this, this fuel um, and you set off some, some detonations outside. And those, those detonations will push the fuel together 
and it'll become dense enough uh, that you set up an explosion. So once again, there's some central source of fuel that has some latent energy, um, and you uh, you confine that energy uh, until until an explosion happens. Um, so if we think about the amount of energy that's released in in the case of a of a firework, this is about a kilogram of black powder. So it roughly equivalent to um, a kilogram of, of TNT. That's a sort of standard uh, energy metric. Um, and in the case of a nuclear weapon, uh, these are 10 million to 50 billion kilograms of TNT. So uh, these are extremely powerful explosions, uh, powerful enough that they uh, represent a existential threat to our own existence. And at least as far as I can tell, it's only by a miracle of, uh, of 80 years of, of diplo diplomacy and collaboration that we haven't uh, that we haven't completely destroyed ourselves. So this is a very powerful uh, explosion that um, that is you know an existential threat to humanity. Now, if we look at astrophysical explosions, so this little speck of light that goes off uh, 20 mil 21 million light years away. Uh, so this is a really incomprehensible incomprehensibly far distance, even for this, this relatively nearby supernova. If we think about the amount of time that it takes for light to get from a, uh, from a firework to our, to our eyes, it takes about a millionth of a second, uh, you know, if it's, if it's about a mile away. Um, it takes about a seventh of a second for light to go around the entire Earth. And so the light coming from here, it takes 21 million years to get to us. And so that tells us that it's extremely far away. And so the the little speck of light here, the only reason why it's uh, so dim is because it's in an, uh, an immense distance. So if it were closer, it would be incredibly powerful. Uh, so how, how incredibly powerful is that? Well, we can compare it to um, the Tsar Bomba, which is the, the biggest nuclear weapon that was ever tested. Um, and uh, we can measure the, the power, of, the equivalent power of one of these explosions in terms of the, the largest nuclear weapon. And it's something like this. I, I don't even know how to say this number, um, but it's it's orders and orders of magnitude uh, more energetic than the biggest thing we can possibly create on Earth. So these are really extreme areas of, of the universe um, that, that present some of the most interesting uh, physics and, and uh, interesting astrophysics uh, that uh, that's out there. So the, these, uh, we'll, we'll go through this in more detail, but. It's, it's really quite an interesting uh, environment. It just, it looks kind of dim just because it's so far away. That's one of the challenges of astronomy is you have to be very creative with a very small amount of dim information to get a whole lot of detail about the interesting stuff that's happening. Okay, so I promised to talk about how this actually happens. How, how do you engineer a, a star to actually explode? Uh, you know, one of the questions might be, uh, how, how likely is it that the sun will explode? Are we at risk of, of the sun doing something like this? Um, and so we can potentially talk about it that, that at the end, but we'll, we'll just leave that open right now. Um, okay, so the recipe for a, uh, a cosmic firework. So first we need some source of energy uh, because the end, this, this latent energy, uh, just like the, the black powder or like the, the nuclear fuel is going to be the, the source of, of the explosion. Um, we also, we can't have this, this energy dispersed around in some diffuse cloud. We need it confined and compacted into a small area. And then we need some kind of spark, uh, something to, to set off a, a very rapid reaction to extract this energy all at once. Um, okay, so uh, before we go, before we talk about stellar explosions and this recipe for stellar explosions, let's go through our two previous examples. So in the case of a fire, the source of energy is the chemical binding energy. So uh, the, the black powder is composed of, uh, fundamentally there's, there's a bunch of carbon in there and uh, you, you burn it. So you, you combine the, uh, you, you oxidize the, these molecules and that uh, by forming these, these bonds that the elements latch into place and they're at a lower, lower energy state, which means they have to emit some energy. So whenever these, these chemical bonds form, you emit energy. You do that for a lot of them and you emit a lot of energy. And so this is chemical binding energy that's a, the, the latent source of energy um, for, for fireworks. Uh, then you have to confine the energy. So you can burn black powder just on a table and it'll burn. Uh, but if you contain it so that, that this pressure builds up inside of the shell, 
uh, that's what turns it into, into an explosion. So in this case, there's a, a shell that contains the gas until you build up that, that high pressure. And then of course, in the case of a firework, the spark is, uh, is lighting the fuse. There's some energy from, from that uh, flammable material that starts off the reaction and, and causes everything to burn very quickly. So you put those three together, you light the fuse and you get a firework. Okay, uh, what about nuclear weapons? So the source of, of, of energy for nuclear weapons, uh, similar to, so for chemical um, uh, like fireworks, it's, it's chemical binding energy. For uh, nuclear weapons, it's nuclear binding energy. So you take nuclei uh, from uh, one nucleus, you, you take one nucleus and you, you split it apart into two nuclei, and that energy is, uh, the, the binding energy is, is lower, and so you get energy that comes out of that. Um, and so you, uh, you extract energy from this, this uh, nuclear binding process. So that's the fundamental source of, of latent binding, of, of, of latent energy. Then you have to confine the energy. Um, so uh, in the example that we showed, there's this explosive compression. So you have this, this fuel and you have these, these charges around the, the outside of the bomb, um, which explode and, and squeeze everything together. Um, and then the thing that starts the, the rapid reactions uh, happening is uh, this radioactive neutron emission. So you have radioactive atoms that are emitting neutrons. Once you get them close enough together, uh, those neutrons uh, will cause other nuclei to emit neutrons, which cause more nuclei to emit neutrons in this chain reaction, which extracts all this latent energy very quickly. Okay, then you get a, a nuclear explosion. All right, so uh, let's let's talk about uh, stars. So there's there's several ways to create explosions on Earth. Uh, similarly, nature has several ways to create explosions uh, in space, and so. Uh, supernovae are not just one thing. Uh, it's very rapidly evolving. There are lots of ideas out there. There's lots of different things that, that nature does. And um, so we'll talk about a couple of them. Uh, so let's let's try one recipe. So maybe uh, nature, nature also has nuclei um, and you can configure those nuclei in, in, a, in a way that, that maybe you can extract nuclear binding energy out of them. Um, in the case of, of stars, we, we don't need uh, any, any kind of uh, compressive uh, explosions to, to squeeze everything together. Because uh, if you have a sufficiently massive star, that star is just very heavy. And so the outer layers of the star are squeezing down and pushing everything together very tightly. Um, and so then all that's left is, is uh, creating a spark. Uh, and so in the case of, uh, of so-called thermonuclear uh, supernovae, which uh, extract the energy from, from binding energy, uh, this can happen in two ways. So either you have some white dwarf here and some uh, star companion that's creating matter onto it. And if you build up enough of this matter, uh, you can uh, start, uh, set off an explosion or uh, set off some nuclear reactions that, that have a similar chain reaction that cause the entire white dwarf, all of the nuclei inside of that white dwarf uh, to extract all of that binding energy and uh, obliterate itself in what's referred to as a thermonuclear or a type one supernova. Um, Alternatively, you can set off that chain reaction. If you have two white dwarfs that are orbiting and they smash together, um, you can set off a, a chain reaction that results in a supernova. It's still debated whether, you know, which one of these is either viable or the, the primary means of creating one a supernova. Um, so this is one example of a fundamental question that's that's been under investigation for a long time. Um, but uh, the end result is that you get a, a type 1a supernova. Um, and you can see that here in, in, a, in a time series of images from uh, from galaxy where you, can, you see that 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 supernova uh, becoming very bright. All right, what else can we do? Uh, so there's there's more sources of energy than uh, than just nuclear binding energy. But uh, yeah, okay. So let, let's let's keep going with nuclear binding energy. So we 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 can do this in more than one way. So perhaps rather than than sparking this reaction with uh, uh, with some collision of neutron stars, we have a single single very very massive star, and it's it's so massive that at the center of that star you have um, a bunch of extremely high energy photons, and these photons um, can uh, can break apart nuclei, which will cause uh, 
uh, the, the inner parts of the star to start contracting, which leads to very, very rapid nuclear reactions. And uh, so this, this photo disintegration, which allows the star to contract and, and launch more nuclear reactions, uh, it is, is a spark for so-called um, uh, parent stability supernova. Now, I don't have a picture of this because to date, this is a completely hypothetical process. Uh, it's one of the major goals of, um, of, of many uh, supernova observers to find uh, even evidence for direct evidence for parent stability supernovae. Um, the, the problem is to get stars that massive, you need to look way back into the very beginning of the universe, which means that everything that we see is going to be very, very far away. Uh, so this is a very hard thing to detect. Um, but so far to date, there has been no conclusive evidence that this actually exists. But theoretically, if you put all these pieces together, you have a, a massive star, like 100 times the mass of the sun. Um, it, it, it has a potential to uh, explode as a, as a thermonuclear parent stability supernova. OK, uh, what else can nature do? Uh, so there's lots of sources of energy out there. We talked about nuclear binding energy. Um, it turns out chemical binding energy isn't really efficient enough to, to create this large explosion. So that's, that's out. Um, but there are lots of other sources of energy. So there's, there's binding energy, which is a form of potential energy, uh, but there's also kinetic energy. So you can form a, a star that has a lot of kinetic energy. Um, so often this, uh, if you uh, can get a star in, into a situation where the, the core is ro rotating very rapidly, um, and you uh, confine that energy by collapsing it down, um, you get uh, you can get what's uh, referred to as a magnetorotational supernova. So you have this core that's rotating extremely quickly, and you can wind up strong magnetic fields that allow you to extract this energy. Um, this is a simulation uh, that was done a, a, a couple of years ago, showing uh, that this the the colors are the strength of magnetic fields. So the yellow is regions of extremely high magnetic field, and you can see that that it's extracting that energy and and driving um, driving gas outward. And you can see that the time scale for this is only uh, you know a hundred milliseconds. So this is a, a very slow mo movie of, of what's happening. But the point is that in these rare kinds of supernovae, uh, you can have a different source of energy that is rotation. Um, so you extract the rotation of magnetic fields, um, and uh, you can launch a, uh, a hypernova. This is a, an example image of a hypernova. And this is interesting because you can get, uh, theoretically, you can get extremely high amounts of energy out of uh, this, this kind of mechanism. The problem is that it's very slow, and we don't understand the interiors of stars very well. And so it's, it's still an open problem to figure out how nature is actually able to put together a star that, that has these properties. It's also difficult to look at stars because really what matters is the rotation in the core. And so we can't see inside of stars, we can only see their surface. Um, and so it, it's another open question as to uh, how common it is to have sufficiently rapid rotation in any kind of star. But okay, so that's, that's recipe number three for a supernova. Um, okay, uh, and this is gonna be our fourth and final recipe, which I will go into a little bit more detail on. So, uh, another source of energy, so we've talked about chemical binding energy, we've talked about nuclear binding energy, we've talked about kinetic energy, um, but there's another source of, of energy, uh, namely gravitational potential energy. So if you can take a star and move it from a state of, of large potential energy, so the, the star is very big, to a state of very small potential energy, um, that energy has to go somewhere. Um, and so Theoretically, we can, we can imagine that if you have this change of energy, maybe there's a way to extract it. So if, if you have that big change of potential energy, you can use the kinetic energy that comes out to explode the rest of the star. Um, so, but once again, we need a, a way to confine all of that energy. And so here, gravity does double duty. Um, it both uh, provides the potential energy that we want to use, and it, uh, it pulls all of that energy together in one place. Um, and then we need a spark. So in this case, a spark to set off that contraction. Um, and the, the most uh, uh, most likely thing that, that happens, or the first thing that happens to set off this kind of collapse is photo dissociation. We, we already talked about this for, um, for parent stability supernovae, but it happens for regular supernovae as, as well. If you have a massive star, the, the core, there's 
uh, photons that are sufficiently energetic that they break apart nuclei and, and allow that quartz to contract. And once it starts contracting, it will contract faster and faster. And so you can get a, a very rapid contraction, lots of energy all in the same place. Um, and so my claim is that you can blow up a star using just gravity. But how does this make any sense? Like our goal is to explode the star, which means the star is, uh, is, is moving outward, but collapse and gravity pull it inward. So how can you use something that only pulls inward to push things outward? Um, and so this has been uh, the, the goal of standard core collapse theory for, for decades. Um, and uh, so in order to explain what the current theory is, uh, I'm going to have to go through uh, a, a little bit more deeply into the uh, into the, the background physics. So I, I should also state that this recipe number four uh, that uses gravity uh, to, to explode the star is the most common kind of, of star explosion. So all the ones we talked about before are, relatively speaking, uh, quite rare. Um, this one is, is by far the most common mechanism, we think. Um, so uh, before I start going into the details of exactly what's happening inside of one of these explosions, I want to pause and just make sure that if there are any questions, um, I would be more than happy to, to talk about them. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Richards, there are there are several questions and they're in they're in the Q&A box. Uh, I, I think you have access to those two. Yeah, but the first one. Ah, great. Uh, so it might be a little bit easier if you were to read them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and answer them, especially the first one. He's asking about a PISN and what that is. Okay. Uh, what does the lower mass gap between neutron stars and black holes have to do with the death of main sequence stars? From what I've heard, a popular theory has to do with parent stability supernovae. What is a parent stability supernova, and how could it possibly lead to a lower mass gap, uh, two and a half to five solar masses, between neutron stars and black holes? Okay, so a parent stability supernova is uh, this kind of thermonuclear supernova where um, you have a star that's uh, above 100 solar masses or so, and the collapse is is, is initiated by um, by the creation of uh, of, of uh, pairs of, of electron positron pairs at the center of this of this nucleus, which extracts a lot of the energy and, and allows it to, to start uh, to, to collapse and allows it to start collapse. The result of a parent stability supernova is that the entire star obliterates itself. There's nothing left behind, no neutron star, no black hole. Um, and so I don't know uh, how this would relate to parent stability supernova. supernova. Um, additionally, with, with main sequence stars, um, so uh, by definition, when stars die, they are off the main sequence. So the main sequence is where the core is, is, is burning hydrogen. Once the core stops burning hydrogen and starts dying, uh, it moves off the main sequence. So you get uh, red giants and red supergiant stars. And so it's only after it moves off the main sequence that you, you see some of these, uh, these, these stellar deaths. Um, so in terms of uh, what could lead to the mass gap? Okay, so there are, uh, there are a couple of, uh, of I, so uh, I, will, I will talk about this uh, in a little bit more detail for, for this particular uh, Recipe four for for supernovae, uh, but I'll just say that that a core collapse supernova can leave behind one of two things: either a neutron star or a black hole. Um, and so, if you leave behind a neutron star, uh, if a if a neutron star is too big, it'll collapse into a black hole. So, there's a maximum neutron star mass. You can't go above that. And so, one of the ideas is that you have some supernovae will explode successfully, and you will explode everything. You'll you'll eject everything but that like one and a half solar mass neutron star. Uh, if it doesn't explode, then you, you have the entire star gets eaten up and you have a, a failed explosion, so nothing really happens. And in that case, you don't just have that one and a half solar mass, you have the entire star in that black hole. And so uh, that's, that's one way that you can create a gap between at most one and a half solar masses neutron star and, um, and black holes that, that start at much larger masses. Now, there are issues with that theory. Um, if you look at the statistics, it's very difficult to show that uh, you know it's it's not at all resolved. Um, but that's just sort of a, a heuristic first argument that, that uh, it, it, it's not necessarily unreasonable to see this gap. Okay, um, are these stars the theoretical pop three stars? Yes. So the the, the hundred solar mass stars are uh, the theoretical population three or the 
uh, the first generation of stars after the universe was born. Uh, how big or how close does it need, need to be to have direct repercussions on Earth? Oh, this is, uh, I, don't, I don't remember the number. There's a great XKCD comic about this. Um, so stars like um, the, the, I hope that Betelgeuse explodes. Betelgeuse is one of the, the closest red supergiants to us, and that would give us an amazing view. And uh, that is, is not close enough for it to have a significant, um, significant effect. So there, essentially there, there isn't a risk for a supernova uh, being, there aren't any stars that are capable of, of exploding as a supernova that are close enough to be a significant risk. Um, but I don't know how close it would have to be. I'd have to, I'd have to think about that. Um, oh, and would it be possible for people just to go supernova? Yes, absolutely. I hope so. Um, all right, good. So if there are more questions, I have the, the Q&A uh, thing pulled up now. So if, if there are more questions, please feel free to just ask. Okay. All right, so the question at hand is, we have a star that collapses, and I'm telling you that somehow that causes it to explode. Uh, so. How, how can we actually explain that? So first, I want to take, take a, a, a step back and just talk about the fundamental nature of the universe. So everything that we see, all of matter, can be explained uh, by uh, these, this set of particles. So we have our quarks, uh, up and down quarks form nuclei that, that uh, you know, is, is, is what we see is, is everyday atoms. Uh, atoms, are, the nuclei are also accompanied by usually an electron, but there are more uh, theoretically possible leptons that, that we've observed. They're just not part of everyday matter. Um, in addition, there's these uh, gauge bosons, gluons, uh, photons, Z bosons, W bosons, which are the, the mediators of the, of the fundamental forces. The Higgs boson is uh, a, a field that interacting with the Higgs boson gives the other particles mass. And uh, the these so-called neutrinos, which are counterparts of the leptons, but they have very, very small masses and they interact extremely weakly. And so uh, up-down uh, quarks and electrons uh, are what primarily make up most matter. But in the case of supernovae, I want to make the claim that, that neutrinos are perhaps uh, the most important part for the explosion itself. Okay, so uh, what exactly uh, are neutrinos? So I, I say that they are a very light, very low mass particle that in interacts extremely weakly. Uh, so how weakly? Uh, so just, just as a fun exercise, if, if you look at your fingernail, it's maybe a, a square centimeter. Uh, how many neutrinos uh, do you imagine are passing through your fingernail? Um, you know, neutrinos per second. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a hint that, uh, that, that the sun is the dominant source of neutrinos uh, on Earth. And so that's because there's lots of nuclear reactions happening inside of the sun. Those nuclear reactions emit neutrinos and um, those, those neutrinos uh, pass, through, uh, pass through Earth, pass through us. Um, so uh, since you've had a second, here's the number. Uh, about 100 trillion neutrinos uh, through just your fingernail every second of every day, uh, day and night, because during the night, uh, the sun is on the other side of the earth and so the neutrinos just pass all the way through the earth and then pass through us and most of them pass through completely unaffected um it, the, the earth is completely transparent to neutrinos um and so how do we even know that neutrinos exist uh well uh the most convincing evidence is that that they interact weakly but they don't interact in them so if you build a big enough detector um so this is uh super Kamiokande in, in japan it's uh, it's a giant tank of water. Right now it's empty, but they, they fill it up with water and they just wait for, there's a huge number of neutrinos that are constantly passing through it. And uh, occasionally a neutrino will happen to, to hit one of these, uh, uh, to, to hit the, the water inside of the tank. And it'll, uh, you can observe the light that comes off that reaction in these many, many cameras that are just lining the wall of this tank. Um, so very rarely something will interact and you'll see a, a small flash of light. Um, so we do know that neutrinos exist. We do know that they interact very, very weakly. Um, and so in terms of everyday life here, they don't matter because there's lots of neutrinos, but they don't do anything. Um, are neutrinos a type of dark matter uh, since they interact so weakly with regular matter? Yes, 
Uh, neutrinos, uh, you, you can call neutrinos uh, dark matter because you don't see them. Um, and if you, uh, so most of uh, the, the matter in the universe is, is, is dark matter, uh, but only a small fraction of, of that dark matter uh, can be neutrinos. So there's a lot of other dark matter. So we, we know uh, roughly how many neutrinos there are in the universe. Um, and it's not nearly enough to explain the rest of the dark matter. So they are dark matter, but there's more dark matter. There's a lot more dark matter than just neutrinos. Okay. Uh, when we build such detectors, such as the ones used for observing neutrinos, can they be used for other experiments or is the purpose of these setups complete as soon as uh, we're done with the experiment? Um, so they are designed for uh, observing neutrinos, but they are also used for uh, a lot of other, uh, mostly mostly uh, theoretical physics. So you can you can propose that, say there's, there's a particle that, like maybe a dark matter particle, um, that we haven't yet discovered. And you can say, well, uh, if I can constrain, I know it has to interact more weakly than some limit because we haven't seen it in super Kamiokande. If it interacted mm -hmm. strongly, we would have seen it. And so you can use these detectors uh, as, uh, as as probes of dark matter, probes of probes of other sorts of things. So it's it's really designed for neutrinos, but it is useful for other, other things. Um, okay. Uh, so are neutrinos dark until we observe them? Oh, that's a good question. What is the boundary between labeling something as dark or actual matter? Um, it's as the difference between dark and actual matter is really just a matter of uh, whether it's easy to see. So before we, we had observed any neutrinos, they still existed. We just hadn't seen them. So at that point, they, you know, they're dark matter. We, we, we can't see them. Um, Really, I mean, I guess the, the way to think about it is if, if we look at a galaxy um, and, and, we, and you know, we have a telescope, we look, we look at the galaxy, we don't see the neutrinos. Um, you, you really have to try very hard. So I think it's, it's just a, a, a word choice that, that people make. So fundamentally, there's, there's no difference between dark matter and, and ordinary matter. Um, it's just how strongly it interacts, whether we'd actually be able to see it. So I would say right now the boundary is probably at neutrinos. Neutrinos are weak enough to be considered dark matter and everything else it's in. All right, good. Okay, uh, so how does uh, one of these stars collapse? So uh, we take, for instance, uh, Betelgeuse is a star that's uh, uh, Betelgeuse is more than 10 times the mass of the sun, but if you have a star that's at least 10 times the, the mass of the sun, uh, it has enough of this confining force uh, to potentially create one of these supernova explosions. So this is an image of Betelgeuse. You can see that the size of Betelgeuse is roughly uh, about Jupiter's orbit. Earth's orbit is, is way inside of there. So this is an absolutely gigantic star. Um, and so these, these massive stars, they, they burn the nuclear fuel far faster and far brighter than, than uh, the vast majority of other stars. Like the lifetime of our sun is uh, maybe 10 billion years total. The lifetime of one of these massive stars is on the order of maybe 10 million years. Uh, so it's, it's a thousand times shorter lifetime. And so these stars are burning their fuel brighter and faster than anything else around them. And so they, they'll sit around for millions of years uh, slowly building up uh, heavier and heavier nuclei in the core. So it starts out as, as mostly hydrogen. As you fuse, fuse these things together, um, you end up with uh, helium and, and heavier elements like silicon and iron. So this is a, uh, an image of a simulation of the uh, center of one of these stars just before it collapses. Um, so this here is a nucleus of iron. Uh, it's split into, into four sections to, to show different quantities, but this is a nucleus of iron. Um, and it's, you know, maybe maybe a thousand kilometers wide compared to the, uh, what is this, a billion kilometer uh, size of the actual star. Um, so it's a very, very small nucleus. And on top of this, way far outside of the plot is all the rest of the star just sitting there on top of that core. Uh, you have a, uh, a layer of silicon, uh, which is uh, which is rapidly burning um, and, and uh, more heavy elements going outward. So after millions and millions of years, uh, you build up this, you slowly build up this, this iron core. And um, 
it's it's only within the last maybe or you, you build up heavier and heavier elements. It's only within the last uh, day or so that you have this this rapid silicon burning, which which builds up the iron core. So after millions of years, uh, in the matter of hours or days, you build up this iron core. And iron in in this case is inert, so it won't continue fusing. It won't continue creating energy. And so um, after all that time, within uh, a fraction of a second, about that fast, uh, that iron core collapses. At this point, the rest of the star, it's still sitting out there. It has no idea that the core has collapsed, but that inner couple thousands of kilometers uh, collapse within uh, you know, maybe uh, 200 milliseconds or something like that. And so you're left over with this uh, with a state, so that core collapses. It becomes uh, the densities of the core exceed the densities inside of atomic nuclei, and you get some. Uh, once that happens, the strong nuclear force says, "Oh, no more collapse. Uh, you're, you're you're dense enough that, uh, like a nucleus, the strong nuclear force will say, nope, uh, it'll prevent the collapse, and it'll bounce back a little bit and launch out a shock wave. And so you're left with something that looks like this, where you have this very dense uh, proto neutron star. Uh, and some hot material that's that's shocked because you have this this shock that's moving uh, that's moving outward. Um, however, at the same time, you have the rest of the star now. It sees that that core is is no longer um, uh, supporting itself, so the rest of the star starts collapsing. And so, while the shock wave is trying to move out through the star, um, the rest of the star is trying to push it back in because it's it's just falling inward. And so, you end up with something uh, that the shock is stalls. It, it moves out to maybe um, one or 200 kilometers, and it just sits there because uh, it's moving out as fast as it can, but the rest of the star is falling in faster. Um, uh, so this is an example of, of, a, of a simulation. Um, so we have that that uh, dense proton star, and you can see the shock wave. And uh, as stuff is falling through the shock wave, you have all this kinds of uh, lots of turbulence. It's very hot. You have nuclear matter. Uh, let's see. So it's it's dense enough that you at this point when you create a this proton neutron star, space time is significantly curved. So you you really do have to start thinking about uh, about general relativity. Um, there's bulk nuclear matter. So this entire nucleus, this entire uh, one to one and a half solar masses of, of matter, is at higher densities than atomic nuclei. Um, and so this is a very weird state of matter that we that we don't see. Um, in ordinary life. It's only in these, these astrophysical environments. There's also hydrodynamics, lots of turbulence, lots of fluid motion going on. That turns out to be really fundamental to, to how the explosion works. If you do this in 1D and require that everything looks spherical, it doesn't work. You need this, this, uh, this violent tur uh, turbulent motion. Um, and then of course, there's, there's also lots of nuclear reactions. As the star is falling in, these nuclei are, are changing. Uh, are, are combining with each other and, and doing all, all sorts of different things. And this is, is important for understanding what kinds of elements end up, end up getting ejected from the explosion. Uh, and of course, um, there's uh, neutrino radiation. Uh, so the key point is that inside we have this dense uh, hypermassive neutron star and it's, it's very hot and matter is falling in. And so we posed the question earlier, why does collapse cause an explosion? And so the key here is that you have neutrinos, neutrinos that are emitted from just outside of this proton neutron star. They carry uh, enough energy to all this other stuff that's under the shock. You have this the shock that's trying to get out the rest of the star, but it can't. So these neutrinos carry enough energy. They dump that energy into that, that fluid that's just under the shock. And by dumping up energy, um, it, it causes the, 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 the shock to be, able to, push that, to be able to be pushed out through the rest of the star. Okay, um, and so uh, you know, I've, I've I've been talking a lot about all the stuff that's happening, uh, but to me, the neutrino is the most interesting part, and this it's it's a very uh, uh, complicated thing to to simulate, uh, but uh, I, I think the physics of it is also very interesting. So just just to say, you know, this isn't just uh, just movies and, and and having fun. There's there's lots of very exciting, very rigorous physics behind it as well. So. To simulate the motion of, of neutrinos, we have to consider the fact that neutrinos are moving in curved space-time. Um, neutrinos are bouncing off of and getting absorbed and emitted by all this, this tur turbulent fluid motion. 
And at the same time, neutrinos are very weird in that they are quantum particles. And so a neutrino sits in a quantum superposition, superposition of states. And so really we have to consider the, the, the quantum mechanics of these, of these neutrinos changing as they're flying around. So this is something uh, that I'm excited about. And so one of the things that I tried to do was actually um, uh, for the first time simulate this neutrino uh, quantum mechanics in three dimensions. Now I did this on a supercomputer and the biggest thing that I could do was, was take out a, a, a cube. This is like a eight centimeter cube. Um, actually, I think I have one right here. Um, it's this size. This is a printout of, of one of my simulations and it's not letting you see it, but it's this size. This is the size of the simulation that I simulated on, on a supercomputer. Not as big as a star, uh, but this is the best we can do because this physics is uh, very computationally demanding. Um, but so that's currently what, what I'm most excited about exploring the physics of these, of these explosions is that these supernovae are um, one of the very, very few environments in the universe that actually cause neutrinos to be collected together in sufficient densities to, to show some of this really weird quantum behavior. You don't get that in the sun because they just escape. You don't get, get that on the earth because they just pass through the earth. But in supernovae, they're trapped. They're dense enough that you get this really weird behavior. Um, okay, and so just to prove it to you, uh, the supernova in 1987, we did see like 20 neutrinos from it. And so that's one of the reasons why I hope that, that Betelgeuse goes off. Because if one of these nearby supernovae uh, happens again, this time with the detectors available today, we'd see thousands of neutrinos. Um, okay. What is, uh, why is it the mass of stars at higher redshift is greater? Ah, great question. Okay. So the, uh, as the star is evolving, um, it's very bright, especially these massive stars. They're burning their nuclear fuel so fast that they're releasing a ton of energy. Um, if you have stuff in the envelope of that star, so the outer layers of the star, um, that, that try to prevent the light from getting out, what the light is going to do is that it's actually going to push on that stuff. And so with these very massive stars, the that energy that's being generated is going to push out the outer layers and it's going to uh, it's going to drive off those layers. And so the, the mass of the star is going to decrease with time just because that intense nuclear burning is just puffing off the outer layers. For the very early uh, stars, there's many fewer uh, heavy elements. Those heavy elements are what provide the most of the opacity for the photons. And so light can escape a lot easier. And so you can build up these massive stars without that light be, or without the outer layers being uh, being injected off. And so it's just possible to get super big stars uh, just because you don't lose all the mass. Okay, so I'm just about out of time. So I will go through this uh, pretty quickly. So we can look at the temperature in a nuclear weapon, compare it to a supernova. The supernova is lots bigger. Uh, the energy output by the largest uh, nuclear weapon uh, that, that has ever been tested on Earth is 50 megatons of TNT. And the energy output by a supernova is orders of magnitude bigger. We can talk about the densities achieved um, in, uh, in these nuclear weapons. You know, in, in the case of a nuclear weapon, it's maybe 200 grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, in the case of a supernova, it's 10 to the uh, 14 or 10 to the 15 grams per cubic centimeter, a lot higher. Uh, the, the size of, of a nuclear blast wave is maybe, maybe uh, on the order of uh, tens of kilometers, whereas for a supernova, it's you, you have this gigantic astrophysical explosion, and the weight of the exploding material in the case of, of nuclear weapons is maybe 30 tons, and of course the star that's exploding is, is, is way, way heavier. So uh, my the, the second to last thing that I'll point out is, so I've, I've told you a lot about how we think that, that stars explode. There's a lot of physics in there that I've, I, I hope I've convinced you that there's a lot that we, still don't, that we still don't understand that we're trying to work out. But it's also true that if you just look at nature, if you're out there uh, looking at the sky with telescopes that are, that are able to, to see things and you just wait, uh, nature is gonna show you things that you don't expect. And so we have, uh, for instance, this is brightness as a function of time for a typical thermonuclear supernova in white, for a typical quark lap supernova in yellow, for that nearby supernova that we saw um, in 1987. Um, and this is an example of a so-called hypernova that is just many, many times brighter. 
Um, and this is just a few examples. These supernovae are observed on a daily basis. And uh, so the point is that the more often you look and the closer you look, uh, the more weird things nature is going to show you. And so this is a huge frontier in astrophysics right now, trying to uh, both find and understand these weird and rare and, and fast events um, that we just haven't seen yet because we haven't been look, looking close enough. And there's, there's uh, much, much more of that to be discovered in the future. So I will leave you with a, uh, with a sort of recipe book of various kinds of explosions. So we have uh, fireworks, nukes, thermonuclear supernovae, parent stability supernovae, uh, core collapse supernovae, um, uh, parent stability supernovae, this shouldn't be photo associated, dissociation, sorry, this should be uh, electron positron pair formation. Uh, electron capture supernovae and hypernovae. Um, the three ingredients, the energy source, confinement, and spark, and a sort of like relative uh, energy yield. Um, and with that, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Richards. We really appreciate that. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating uh, presentation. We appreciate that. And thank you for everybody who um, attended today and for your questions. Um, we hope you enjoyed this and hope you'll sign up for many more of our Reyes presentations over the next couple of weeks. So we thank everybody and we will be turning everything off and leaving this presentation uh, at this point. All right. Okay. Thank you again. I'm sorry. Uh, thank Dr. you all Chairman, very much. Do you have a second? I do. I, I, I would be happy to answer the question. Yep. There's another question. It just popped in. Okay. Yeah. So is, is it possible to predict a supernova uh, to say maybe a few years? Possibly from gravitational waves. Um, maybe. Um, gravitational waves are difficult um, because you really need a lot of matter moving very quickly. Um, so if there is a supernova that's sufficiently close by, what will happen? So the, the explosion takes uh, a matter of hours to days, or well, a matter of hours to get from that core to the edge of the star. So during that time, while that, that shock wave, those hours during which the shock wave is propagating, we'll just see a regular star because we can't see inside of it. Even though it's, it's in the process of exploding, we don't see it until it gets, the shock wave gets, gets to the outside. Um, however, if it's close enough that we see gravitational waves from all the, the violent uh, turbulence happening inside, then we will be able to uh, hopefully predict the supernova, you know, a couple of hours before it actually happens. Um, you can potentially do the same thing with neutrinos um, if it's sufficiently nearby. Uh, and for very nearby stars, uh, we can see, uh, hype, theoretically, we can see neutrinos, more neutrinos being emitted as that nuclear burning rate increases in the core, as it's building up that iron core, you know, maybe hours to days before the explosion actually happens. Um, so. That's all very theoretical. This has never been done before. Um, a lot of people are hopeful that if it's close enough, we can get neutrinos before the explosion. We can get lots of neutrinos after the explosion. We can get gravitational waves uh, after the explosion uh, and a lot sooner than we see the photons. Um, but predicting it years in advance, uh, no, I, I don't think there's any way that, that anybody knows of right now to uh, predict a supernova beyond more than you know, a couple of days. Um, we started a little bit late, so we, maybe we can go an extra minute or two. There are two other questions out there. Okay. Okay. I just graduated from high school and I want to make, uh, I assume you want to, you want to study astrophysics, but you're enrolled in engineering. Uh, so where can I start studying astrophysics? Um, so I would say that the, the first thing to do would be um, understanding math and physics makes astrophysics possible. And so that's that's the number one thing. So we, we talked a lot about astrophysics, but fundamentally everything that happens is, is described by the same old physics uh, that describes everything else. Um, so math and physics are, are super, super important. Um, I think, I think for most people, the first time that you actually get a course in astrophysics is, is when you're in, in college, 
uh, if, if you're lucky, your, your high school might offer some astronomy. Um, but I will also say that engineering is, is pretty darn cool. Uh, when, when I was a, a, uh, an undergrad, I took some engineering classes uh, to, to learn about fluid dynamics, because that's something that engineers do a lot more than, than physicists do for some reason. Um, and so there's a lot of really, really cool stuff happening uh, in, in engineering. So uh, yeah, I, I, I would say uh, there, there's also lots of cool stuff. So uh, you can, for instance, if you, you can look for, there's a site called Astrobytes. If you really want to keep up to date with uh, current, the, the current events that are happening, uh, there's a site called Astrobytes where essentially there's um, uh, scientists will, will take literature that's currently being published. So this is like the, the fresh off the press that people are uh, sort of digesting and turning into, into shorter articles so you can get the sort of the basic point of, of everything that's happening. But in terms of like full courses, yeah, probably, probably college, but yeah, math, physics, very important. Um, is our own sun an interesting body and potentially interesting to understand the fields involved in these processes? Yes, very much so. So um, as with, all other stars, uh, we can't see inside of the sun. Uh, we have a bunch of circumstantial evidence that tells us about what's happening inside. So for instance, we see the neutrinos from the sun, which uh, corroborates uh, our, our theory that the, 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 the source of energy for the sun is, is nuclear burning that, that creates uh, neutrinos. Um, and so we can see those. So we have some idea of what's happening inside, uh, but there's a lot that we don't understand. So the sun, um, Let's see, what are some open questions? Um, so in terms of, of the, the specific details of the interior of the sun, so what elements are present and what quantities throughout the, the, the sun, that's something that potentially we can understand by looking at like fluctuations of the sun or by looking at the particular spectrum of neutrinos that are emitted. Um, but there, there are some inconsistencies uh, in, in what we determine the structure of the sun to be. Uh, from these different avenues. So there's some disagreement. So even though one measurement claims to understand the inside of the sun, other measurements disagree. And so uh, as much as we think we understand about the sun, there's, we still don't know fundament fundamentally what's happening inside. Also on the surface of the sun, the surface of the sun is a rich source of all kinds of, uh, of magnetic plasma processes um, that, that are still very difficult to explain. And it's uh, a great source of information because it's relatively nearby. Um, but we still lack the, the theoretical tools to explain all these processes from, from the beginning. So yeah, the sun is still very, very interesting. Um, book recommendation. Uh, let's see. So I'm assuming this is high school. Depends on like high school, college, or, or graduate student. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll assume high school. So I don't know. Other other than than textbooks, I think I think the the, the most interesting one is maybe uh, I, I like Hawking's a, a, a Brief History of Time. If you haven't read it, you should. Um, talks a lot about so uh, relativity is is very important both talking about the, the early universe and the origin of the universe and talking about the, the stuff that happens deep inside of a supernova and black hole and all that kind of thing. So maybe I would, that would be what I would, what I would recommend. Uh, how will Dune aid our understanding of neutrinos and astrophysics in the future? Okay, so something I, I didn't explain about neutrinos is there is it, um, neutrinos, uh, I, I mentioned that neutrinos do this weird quantum behavior that, that's very different inside of a supernova than it is, um, uh, you know, like from, from the sun or on earth. Uh, part of the mystery of neutrinos is that we still don't know exactly what their properties are. We don't know what their masses are. We know they're, they're small masses. So we, we say they can't be too big, otherwise we would notice, but they're very small masses. Uh, and we, we don't know uh, what they are. We just have an upper limit. Uh, we don't know um, the fundamental nature of neutrinos. So there, there's a, a Dirac theory for neutrinos and there's a Majorana theory for neutrinos. Both of them reproduce what we've seen so far, but they're so hard to detect that, that we, uh, we don't know uh, which one of these is actually correct. Um, 
So th there's a lot about neutrinos that is poorly understood, and Dune is is targeted uh, toward understanding some of those uh, those particular features. However, if there is a supernova that goes off nearby enough, Dune is is designed to find to 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 figure out what those fundamental properties of neutrinos are. But if there's a nearby supernova, it'll see those neutrinos too. Um, and so it's it's one of the several detectors that's an important part of the the, the network of neutrino detectors that. Um, would be useful for seeing a nearby supernova in neutrinos. Okay, good. I think I just had something. This came in in the chat, and this we'll have to take this as our last one, Doctor. Um, sure. So uh, the question, I guess, was uh, there are a few stars which explode while others implode. Can you explain in brief which stars do the following, talking on basis of mass and size? Um, okay, so um, let me let me put white dwarf stars. Uh, so white dwarf stars, if they explode, uh, they explode. They, they, they don't implode. Um, so we'll, we'll leave that to, off, off to the side as, as a different thing. So I'm, I'm going to assume now that we're talking about uh, regular uh, like red giant stars. And so uh, some of those stars, like the, the, the sun, one solar mass, will not explode. It also won't implode. It'll, uh, it'll finish off its nuclear fuel, but it's not compact enough. And so it will, it'll just puff off its outer layers and, uh, and sit around as a white dwarf and, unless something else happens to smash into it. So uh, no explosion or implosion. Once you get above uh, eight or 10 solar masses, that's where you have enough of this, of this compressive force to, to, to form those iron nuclei that lead to a collapse. So above that mass, um, everything is going to collapse. Now, whether that collapse leads to an explosion, I, maybe is the, the question I'm getting at. That's uh, a that, that's, that's different answer. So above eight or 10 solar masses, uh, they're, they're going to collapse. Uh, now, uh, what leads a particular star to explode versus not explode is still an active area of research. There are a lot of recent leads, uh, but I would say that it's still not not well understood what causes one star to explode and one star not to explode. Um, so you can look at like the, the profile of, of density of the star that's collapsing, how much, you know, how quickly the silicon uh, interface uh, advects down into the explosion. So, you know, there, there are some ideas, but fundamentally it's, it's not known. Uh, maybe uh, up to, uh, you know, 20 solar masses or so, we expect that, that most of the stars between 10, 10 and 20 solar masses will uh, explode above that you simulations show that those explosions fail and so it, it'll actually just end up collapse, collapsing without an explosion but there's also small details where you can take the, the same star and change just a little tiny thing sometimes it'll explode sometimes it'll collapse so it can be a, a random thing that's it's not predictable um so I, I hope that answers the question even if it's a bit confusing because the field is confused about it as well Okay, and if you do have time, <laughs> we'll we'll take one more, and yeah. this will be this will be that. Okay, okay. Uh, we know that gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. Let's say we uh, found the future that is indeed gravitons that carry gravitational energy. Can we find similarities between photons and gravitons? Um, so, uh, not putting aside the question of gravitons. Uh, gravitational waves do carry energy. Um, so for instance, if you look at like mergers of black holes, they will tell you like the, the, the mass of black hole number one and the mass of black hole number two, they merge and you get the mass of black hole number three. If you look at the mass of black hole number three, it's a lot less than the sum of the two initial masses. And the reason for that is the gravitational waves that it launches carry a bunch of that energy and therefore a bunch of that mass away. So there is energy in, in gravitational waves. How that corresponds to gravitons, um, I don't, I would not be qualified to talk about gravitons because I, I don't understand the potential particle nature of gravity. Uh, 
so I, I'll have to leave it there. I, I, I don't know how to answer that. But hopefully that was enough of an answer. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you again, all of our participants. Uh, thank you, Dr. Richards. We appreciate everything. And again, we hope everyone will take a look at the rest of our schedule. Uh, we have several weeks left in our Reyes program. And uh, hopefully there are some other things out there that you'd also like to participate in. So take a look at our schedule and sign up for some additional uh, presentations or some of our mentoring classes. So again, thank you very much. And I am going to go ahead and, uh, and uh, close this out. Thank you again. Thanks.